Saigo, and welcome to the Administration for Native Americans webinar entitled Effective Community-Wide Native Language Strategies. This webinar is being hosted by the Eastern Region Training and Technical Assistance Center, a resource of the Administration for Native Americans. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on ANA and Eastern's websites in about two weeks. My name is Dawn David and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. I am currently the training specialist for the Eastern Region and a member of the Mohawks of Akwesasne, which is located in northern New York and Canada. I've also included the contact information for the Eastern Region Training and Technical Assistance Center. There you'll find our toll-free number and our website. Just uh, this is like the biggest question I get most often, I don't know about um, the other staff, is when are the funding opportunity announcements going to be out? So I took this quick minute to provide an update. The notice of public comment, or the NOPIC, was published on January 23rd, and a copy of that, like I mentioned, is located in the handouts. There's a 30-day comment period, and at the end of the 30-day comment period, ANA will um, answer some answer the questions that were submitted for those and once that is complete completed then the funding opportunity announcement can be published and once the funding opportunity is published which would um, be around late Jan uh, late February the deadline will be 60 days after that date Okay, so let's begin our webinar. For an overview, this webinar will focus on language strategies to mobilize our communities in language acquisition. We are fortunate to have a past and a present ANA recipient for this webinar to demonstrate their success in two different stages of their language revitalization. Our first presenter is from the Alaska Native Heritage Center. They are a current grantee and have a long history of promoting language use within their community. Their current project, entitled ANHC Urban Eskimo Language Revitalization Project, Inupiaq and Yupik Languages, provides language instruction directly to their community. The Akwesasne Freedom School is our next presenter and will show how their past ANA projects had a ripple effect into the community. The Akwesasne Freedom School has recently concluded their Esther Martinez Immersion Project. In addition, they have also managed two other native language ANA grants in the past. We look forward to hearing from both presenters about their experiences with language strategies that have sparked language revitalization movements within their respective communities. Our next presenter is Marcella Arsiksik. She is the Language Project Director at the Alaska Native Heritage Center in Anchorage, Alaska. She started at ANHC in 2006 and has been with their language department the last four years. In 2012, Marce Marcella seized the opportunity of being the language coordinator for ANHC's first ANA language grant, assisting in researching language programs around the state of Alaska. Currently, she is the Language Project Director under the Preservation and Maintenance Language Grant that ANHC received in 2014. Marcella is passionate about preserving Alaska Native languages and serving her community. Her personal goal is to become fluent in Simagak language of the Simsinian, which, is, which she speaks daily with her daughter and soon-to-be-born son in April. Outside of the language department, Marcella has volunteered her time teaching Somalgics to community members in Anchorage. And welcome to Marcella, and I apologized for any mispronunciation. <laughs> Marcella. Emma Gunsak, Sagatnimi dot Simsendawayu, Kanhara Deep Tegu, Will Aksema Deep Gu Aku, Nigyoksi Will Plugin. Uh, my traditional name is Pull Songs from the River of Skeena. I'm Simshian from the Raven Clan. My family comes from Mount Lakatla, Alaska, and today I live here in Anchorage. Uh, thank you all for being here today. So um, we received a Urban Eskimo Language Revitalization Project um, here in 2004. Uh, our initial language grant um, that we received in 2012 helped us do research in applying for our current um, grant that we have, and we just began uh, year three. So the Alaska Native Heritage Center, we're located in Anchorage, Alaska. We're on the far east side of Anchorage. We're a nonprofit organization. 
to our educational and cultural facility. Um, the picture on top shows you the front side of our building, and we just had an expansion of our building that was dedicated to one of our elders, uh, Mabel Pike, who is a Slinket elder who helped in the ground breaking of our center when we opened 16 years ago. It has grown quite a bit since then. On the back side of our lot, we have uh, Lake Tiolana, which was named after one of our elders uh, from King Island, which is the northern um, part of Alaska. And around uh, our lake, we have six traditional village sites, so guests who come and visit us in the summertime can see uh, what our homes like look like um, before Western contact. The Alaska Native Heritage Center mission is to share, perpetuate, and preserve the unique, unique Alaska Native cultures, languages, traditions, and values through celebration and education. So our urban Eskimo language revitaliza revitalization project goal is to develop an Inupiaq and Yupik language program promoting culturally based fluency through teacher training and development of multi-generational immersion activities. Our language team is based on the survey that we did with our one-year grant um, from 2013. Our teachers are balanced based on the desire of the Anchorage community. Currently on our team with our UPIC cohort, we have three UPIC teachers, two UPIC assistant teachers, two UPIC advisors, and two UPIC elders. Our Inupiaq cohort consists of four Inupiaq teachers and one Inupiaq advisor. Our language team uh, ranges in ages from 16 to 91 years old. So the way our uh, grant cycle works for the each year uh, of our three-year grant is we start off with um, training all of our language team members in different techniques. Then they go on to developing lesson plans to build our curriculum. And then from those lesson plans that they create, they pilot them and seeing how they work uh, in our evening language classes. So we go through this cycle uh, each year, and the training workshops are open to other language programs to attend uh, alongside with our language team and staff. They've been trained in total physical response, which is a method that was created by John Asher. And in year one of our grant, we had the pleasure of um, having Todd McKay, who worked very closely for many years with uh, Dr. John Asher, on the method where it's uh, learning language through actions and commands. Our second uh, language method training workshop that we have is Where Your Keys, which is a method that was um, created by Evan Gardner. And a lot of uh, this style of method is using the language, um, having it in the air right away through the use of playing different games. And there's a lot of great setups um, from this method that um, our teachers use and implement in the classroom. The third method is the accelerated second language acquisition. Um, some folks might know this better off as the Gray Morning method. Uh, we were very fortunate to have Dr. Stephen Gray Morning come and teach us um, his method. Um, this tool has the use of pictures um, and creating uh, sentences as well as storytelling with the use of pictures uh, in his method. And uh, each year that we've brought him in, our teachers have increased um, their skill sets from this method that he's uh, worked with our teachers directly. Uh, the last training workshop that we have our staff go through is um, so we're able to create uh, assessments and benchmarks to um, track our participants, our students' progression on um, where they are when they first enter the classroom and where they are at the end of each year. And our assessments and benchmarks are based off of the American Council on Teaching Foreign Languages. And we've created a great partnership with the University of Oregon's um, Northwest Indian Language Institute um, professors that have come and helped us in working on that, and they work directly with our teachers, um, even when they're not here uh, during the training workshops. They've been connecting with them through teleconference. So our language team has been very successful with the tools they've received from the training workshops that we've had two um, successes with our assistant teachers being promoted to teacher. 
one of our Anupiak assistant teachers was promoted in year one of our grant, and one of our Yupik assistant teachers was promoted um, just last month to teacher. Our trainings have engaged uh, all team members, especially our elders, as well as a cross-generational learning uh, with our youth and our elders working together. So our current objectives um, that we had in the fall time, we had uh, eight classes, um, eight for in uh, the Anupiaq language and eight in the Yupik language. And then we had our four training workshops for training our staff on the same uh, language method as well as the assessment and benchmark workshop. Currently, we're, uh, we're just starting our spring session, so we're having eight classes in the spring. Along with that, we're hosting four immersion activity family nights. So this is just focusing on one activity, all in the language. Our youth cohort focused on Yurok, which is uh, dancing. So we did that for our first uh, immersion activity family night. And our Anupiaq cohort um, focused on games, so all of our students uh, learned how to play UNO in a new Uh Each month, uh, e each of our cohorts meet once a month. And because of our um, evening language classes, it's very hard for to get both cohorts together. So we switched our language team meetings from monthly to quarterly just because of our busy schedules with our classes that we host in the evening. Uh, next month in February 18th and 19th, we'll be hosting our third annual Immersion Strategies Gathering. This is the opportunity of bringing in presenters from other language programs around the state as well as beyond Alaska. And they're able to share on their successes with other language programs. There's a lot of great sharing time as well as networking, hearing other people's challenges and learning about other different techniques and methods that are working for other language programs. In addition to our evening classes, um, each of our cohorts hosts a two-day um, immersion camp where we work with students uh, in the Anchorage community. And this will take place in the end of spring, uh, early summer. And we try to incorporate um, with the use of subsistence um, that is taking place during those months to give our urban um, Alaska Natives the opportunity if they haven't been back to their home village to learn uh, how to butcher a seal or how to put up fish and um, smoke it in for stocking up for the winter time. At the end of our uh, third year of our grant, we'll be compiling all of our lesson plans to share our curriculum with other language programs in the state as well as other uh, language programs in the lower 48. Uh, we do a lot of um, outreach to our community to participate in our classes and our workshops, and so it creates a great um, partnership with everyone in seeing what our language program has to offer for language learners. So here we have some pictures of showing um, our teachers in action. Uh, this year, with our total number of participants that we've had in our evening language classes, um, we've had 48 in our Anupiaq class. 30 adults and 18 youth. And for our UBIC classes, we've had 50 participants, um, 40 adults and 10 youth. Our participants um, come from all sorts of avenues that participate. Um, we've had Alaska Native Heritage Center staff, our president, CEO, numerous amounts of Anchorage community members. Uh, we have a partnership with the Anchorage School District, so a lot of their teachers attend our workshops as well as our evening language classes. Uh, we host a brown bag language circles in the month of July, which give our um, seasonal staff here at the Alaska Native Heritage Center, our summer interns, a chance to learn how to introduce themselves uh, in Anupiaq and Yupik as they interact um, with guests that come to visit Alaska. And um, having seasonal guests around the center in the summertime gives our teachers a chance to work with them as well, and it helps our language team see how it is to teach someone who has never been exposed to the language. Our uh, lesson plans are a continued effort on how our teachers can better themselves for meeting their students' needs, which are also met through our uh, pre-assessment tool that we've created. 
Uh, since year one, we've seen phenomenal growth amongst our language team, allowing fluent speakers the tools to bring out their natural teaching abilities. Uh, each class keeps getting better and better as the years have progressed. Uh, when a lot of our teachers have shared um, seeing their teachers grow in the classes that we've been providing, that the students, um, now that we're in the midst of year three of our grant, our teachers are seeing a lot of our students thinking more in the language with the, um, them continuously coming to our evening classes. Uh, one of our students shared in their evaluation at the end of the year last year that they were very um, thankful for the free sessions that we provide. Uh, for a while, they'd been wanting to learn their mother's tongue, and now they have a chance to. And so they're very thankful um, for us being able to provide free language classes, which was uh, one of the obstacles that we saw in our survey from 2013. Uh, we asked Anchorage community members uh, what was holding them back from learning their Alaska Native language. And one of them was money. And so with our current grant, being able to provide free opportunities for people to learn the language has um, helped uh, tremendously with our numbers of participants in each class. And with the space that we have, um, unfortunately, it's been hard to turn people away who have wanted to sign up to the class and it being full just because of the space size. But we're very fortunate to have the participants that we have. Uh, some of the challenges that we've had uh, over the years of this three-year grant is um, we provide stipends. All of our language team members are contractual staff, and so we compensate them from the, their time with stipends. And unfortunately, we lost uh, two of our Inupiaq elders uh, last year because our stipends were too generous, and the housing that they're currently in is uh, income-based. And because our stipends were too generous, um, their rent had gone up. And so they left our program, but they still volunteer their time in working with our uh, Anupiaq teachers and assistant teachers in uh, still being a resource to them when they're working on their lesson plans and curriculum. Uh, another ongoing challenge has been recruiting speakers and teachers. And that's something we've been doing continuously um, through each year. Um, Sometimes we have staff that move back to the village, and so we're, we're uh, continuously recruiting uh, for our language team. Another challenge was um, finding a central location for students to participate in the classes. Uh, our Alaska Native Heritage Center is a great uh, facility, and we have great space um, that we can use, but it is uh, on the far east side of town, and we have overcome some of the challenges uh, with that in building partnerships with other organizations in town so we're able to have a more central location for classes um, to be held. That also where the um, bus line system can go to for um, students who don't have transportation. Another challenge that we've had is a dialect. Our teachers and assistant teachers, as well as our elders and advisors, all come from different areas in their region, and their dialects are very different. But they have been able to uh, communicate with one another as they're planning and creating lesson plans and developing curriculum. And um, our students have been very understanding with the teachers, as we want them to be as comfortable as possible teaching in the dialect that they're most familiar with. And uh, it's also open doors for um, students learning a different dialect from theirs. It's given them the opportunity to go back to their villages and learn from uh, their elders and seeing the differences in the dialects from what they're learning here in Anchorage compared to what um, their dialect is in their home village. So our plans for uh, sustainability in keeping our language program going uh, is strongly um, uh, in part with partnerships that we've created. On the top left of your screen, you'll see um, one of the KNDA uh, radio announcers working with one of our advisors. Uh, KNDA radio station has given us free um, publicity and advertising our language classes, so we're able to get the word out um, through them. And in return, we've done um, 
recorded a lot of advertising for KNDA in Anupiaq and Yupik uh, in exchange for them uh, helping us get the word out for our classes. Another big um, help in sustaining our language program are the committed and enthusiastic uh, language team. Uh, all of the tools that our teachers have under their belt now with all the training that we've provided for them have really encouraged them more um, to continue in teaching the language in the Anchorage community. And all of this we couldn't have done without the uh, involvement of our community members in our classes. And uh, that concludes my uh, presentation. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, if any of you have any questions at the end, I'll be sticking around for that. And there's my contact information if you think of something afterwards. And we uh, encourage you and invite you to uh, check out our Facebook page. It's um, titled Alaska Native Languages. That's how we do a lot of our um, promoting of our language program. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Marcella. I think I um, speak for everyone. That was very informative. And I really like your pictures <laughs> of Alaska. <laughs> thank you. Um, all right, so next um, we are going to bring on Maxine Cole. Maxine Cole is Haudenosaunee from the Ganyagahaga Nation in the territory of Akwesasne and Bear Clan. Maxine has a Master of Science degree from the University of Ottawa and has been speaking Ganyagaha for about 10 years. Fortunately, the opportunities to learn were provided through ANA programming and with her mother to guide her. She graduated from the Adult Immersion Program and has been teaching at the Akwesasne Freedom School since that time. Currently, she is teaching math and science to grade five and upper levels. She keeps busy with her daughter's family of three beautiful children. Maxine. Hello. Sego Zuwagwego, Gayat Honda, Yungek, Stana Waxklewage, Dana Rodana Shoni, Wagana Hunjodo, Dana Gigalon, Akwasasni. Welcome to everyone. I'm glad you're here. My name is uh, Gayat Honda, my Mohawk name, and I'm Bear Clan and reside in Akwasasna in the territory. Next slide, please. And today I'm going to talk about our history with ANA grants and how it's revitalized, helped to revitalize the Mohawk language in the territory of Akwesasne. Next slide, please. And so you'll see here a map of northern New York State where Akwesasne is actually located. And um, we're right on the border of New York State and Canada, the province of Ontario. We also actually part of Akwesasne goes into Quebec too, and so that's the other uh, picture on the right-hand side that uh, shows uh, somewhat the extent of the territory, but for us as Haudenosaunee, it goes beyond that purple border also. And so here's a picture of the Akwesasne Freedom School, one of the buildings, and that's Sago Anahwe. He actually worked under the ANA grant also, and some of our students and one of the parents. So this is one of our buildings. This houses the pre-K until grade four, and a two-story building we have also that houses grade five and up. And we also have a house for the language nest. Next slide, please. And so it's the mission of the school is that through our language, the Akwesasne Freedom School will support and encourage a process for each child to learn their roles and responsibilities as Haudenosaunee through an understanding of the Honda Galiwatakwa as the course of the core of their learning experience. The guiding principles of Skana, peace in our minds, Kazatstansla, the strength of who we are as a person, Leo, having a good mind, will thrive and be heard in the voices of our generation for the our in the voices of our children for the next seven generations. The Akwazasna Freedom School is supported by the traditional government at the Mohawk Nation, and that's the Mohawk Nation Council of Chiefs. And I'll talk a bit more about the Ahondagali Deco on another slide. Next slide, please. So a history of the ANA grants received the by the Akwazasne Freedom School. 2003-2006 was the Ganyankeha Adult Fluency and Teacher Training Program, of which I was a graduate from. I started, it was a three-year grant, I started in year two, but currently the teachers we have are 11 out of 16 people who graduated from that course actually currently teach at the Akwazasne Freedom School in a 
in uh, in all of the grades. And then in 2008, 2011, in the manner of our old ways, and the purpose of that three-year grant was to develop and implement immersion component, an immersion component for grades seven and eight. And back in 2008, grades seven and eight were English transition courses and parents started to move towards thinking that they went towards half a day uh, learning our old ways and the other half of the day was English. 2013-16 we just finished up Geo Hahoda choosing our path and this was to implement an immersion environment for upper, upper level students something beyond grade 8. What actually transpired was uh, we have younger a younger class in starting um, usually well this year it's grade 5 we've actually taken them in to expand and uh, give them more advanced language next slide please I mentioned the Ohonda Gariwatekwa and so this means that in our original instructions we were given the responsibility of acknowledging what the Creator has given us every day and so what better foundation to derive all our curriculum from and to teach the students from and it's an acknowledgement for like I said all the Creator has given us on earth and in the sky and here you can see not only in ceremonies where uh, the Honda Gariwatakwa was actually started, but it becomes a personal thing within families, within individuals. And these are words that are acknowledgement of words that are given morning and afternoon at ceremonies, the beginning and the end of the ceremony, and thus our school day opens and closes in that way. So what's happened as people had learned that our students were able to stand up as individuals and recite this opening and closing, we were inundated with invitations for community events, meetings and other gatherings of people to go out into the community in Akwazasne and for the students to recite the Ohonda Gariwatakwa. So that's uh, always been, and it's in, had increased quite a bit over time, our invitations outside of the school. Next slide. Revitalizing the language. We've always, the basis of the school is participatory activities as Marcella had referred to in her presentation. It's to encourage language acquisition and retention. It's that they're hands-on activities. And so it's to engage students at the very beginning to the end. And I'll go through some of those activities later on. Each activity generated a wealth of written and recorded information and so as uh, Marcella was talking and she talked about for certain subjects the fluent speaker was there but we also wanted to tap into the students knowledge of other ways of knowing and learning and so we asked and developed written recorded information which generated worksheets games audio video recordings primers posters and books next slide so some of our hands-on activities were like making a water drum, traditional water drum, which included, you know, knowing the trees and then um, actually we had an elder in, I call him an elder, he's quite an expert in, in making uh, everything. And so he came in and helped us, the Hanusiga. And how to make a traditional gustoa using black ash splints, turkey feathers, and a gift and again, various language groups within Akwazasana have seasonal gatherings of medicine plants. Next slide. We do demonstrations of black ash basket making. Next slide. And also uh, fishing, hunting and trapping, seasonal activities with fluent speakers to teach the language and guide people during activities, for example, cleaning fish. Next slide. Gardening, saving heritage seeds, our Haudenosaunee seeds, and then planting for the school and sharing with the community. And so in all of this, in all of our activities, as the students fit, complete their projects, whatever that may be, water drum, gastoa, um, pipes, whatever that may be, we always invite their parents in. And so their families come in to see what kind of work they've been uh, up to over the last few weeks, over the last few months. And then we also 
um, have put some of our completed projects into auctions for the school so that the school actually benefits too. So people recognize that the students are able to do this. So I believe that as that, as demonstrating, students demonstrating their projects, there are other groups who, language groups who are studying, who've also scheduled interactive activities. And this is the Soil to Seeds workshop, but we've also been to a workshop caring for honeybees and making psalms. What's really important is that the students don't go alone when the Akwazasne Culture Restoration invites us uh, because they know our students understand the language is that uh, their families, the students' families attend. And so our last event, the I think we were went for looking at seeds, corn, and beans. So we had about 10 families, uh, 10 students, 10 of their families actually went with them to the workshop. So it's encouraging the whole family to learn and to go. So the benefits are widespread that I see within Akwazasne. Uh, here are some of the groups that have benefited from our work. They've taken our basic written material and they've used it in their language classes. One of them is the St. Regis Mohawk tribe, our elected government stateside. And I've seen the material, and like I said, it's just basic written material and they develop it as they need it. Mohawk Council of Akwazasne is another, uh, it's on the Canadian, what we call the Canadian portion of Akwazasne, their elected council also, and they've used our material also. Again, basic, our basic stories, our basic Ohonda Gariwetekwa, and they've taken it and they've developed it for their needs, developed it more. The Akwazasne Economic Development Agency, another agency within Akwazasne, started promoting language classes and they took a lot of our material again and developed it more than where we had it, our basic material. Akwazasna Task Force on the Environment is a environmental uh, task force that oversees uh, environmental issues within Akwazasna so they've used our material also and we work in collaboration with them on the seed and tree giver way so that all the labels are written in Ganyakeha, the children can read them and they help pack those bags up with seeds and so they're distributed to the community so the community actually gets a bag of seeds or heritage seeds and their, the Mohawk name of that seed is on there so in that way they're learning too. The Akwazasne Cultural Restoration is in there last year and so they've used a lot of our material to jumpstart their program and at this point we're sharing information all the time. Uh, we find that um, they, they will start something and we add more to it and I'll show an example of that later on. Salmon River Central School is a public school and we are constantly sharing with them our material and they provide us with some of their material also. So this is one of the projects in collaboration, uh, in collaboration between the Akwazasne Freedom School and the Akwazasne Cultural Restoration, the Ogiondoro. It's the lake sturgeon. And so these two girls, actually there were five, six, six students initially that worked on this project. Three of them worked, well they all worked during the summer so many hours per week and then we ended up four of the students because the other two had went on to public school for students finished this product and it's all written in Ganyakeha with pictures from the old days and uh, today. Thank you. Uh, next slide. Other benefits that I've seen, there's Overall community awareness has increased of Ganyakeha language and cultural knowledge. And I say that because different places that I have gone to, I can hear people talking. Uh, I was working a short time with Justice and uh, one of the young women there was working with her grandmother on uh, language and I, and, and I knew what she was talking about because it was one of our lessons that were generated from the a and grant. So she was conversing with her grandmother and her grandmother was helping her with the language. Another is the Akwazasana Mohawk Board of Education. Their teachers would come over to Mohawk Council's language classes and um, in that group there was a young woman and her older sister 
and I know they both converse uh, at this time. They're trying really hard to uh, learn the language. Another place in the Aquasna Cultural Restoration, a lot of those people are new. My niece is there, and so when I sit with her, we can carry on a conversation uh, for just about anything. And so I know she's studying really hard. Within Aquasna Task Force on the Environment, we have a wife and husband team that are working hard and um, Yudenilaka Daniel works hard because she used to work at our school, so the benefit of that is that it's gone into her family too and her children are speakers. The ADA, the Aquasna Economic Development Association, I can see um, there, uh, let's see, so my daughter's taken a class there and uh, no, there's somebody, there's a young woman there and she works with her grandmother but she teaches her brothers too, so that ripples out into the families. And I know at the tribe, one of the workers uh, that I know of, she's learning because she started in the ANA, the adult uh, program, and she couldn't stay because of funding, uh, money issues, had to return to her job. But I know she's carried on because she currently uh, is a leader for supervisor for the uh, Aquasna culture restoration and so that continues in her family uh, all her three children are fluent speakers so a lot of community awareness as a result of ANA monies being funneled into the Aquasna Freedom School I see more attendance at traditional ceremonies people feel more comfortable even if it's just some of the basic language that they know they can recognize it in the ceremony so they feel that they're better able to sit there maybe not understand everything but they do they're beginning they're easy I guess their awareness has increased and they have they're more at ease with themselves at the St. Regis Mohawk Tribe in Mohawk Council of Aquasasna, the first line workers at reception answer the phone, they say Sego, and one of the workers at uh, MCA, I'm able to carry on a conversation with her, so, and I know she went to the Aquasasna Economic Development Agency to gain more knowledge for speaking. Within the Aquasasna Freedom School, our teachers have increased their knowledge uh, many times uh, of cultural traditions and legends and stories and so they feel more at ease and more able to teach our children, our students. Interactive, interactive activities, like I said, they encourage the students with their families, with the teachers and the elders and we're all together and it's a great feeling because those ages can span anywhere from under one year old up until um, into their 80s. Next slide. We believe that students are better prepared to enter public school uh, they have a better sense of who they are, they realize the importance of language and their cultural ceremonies, their cultural stories, their legends, and so they go through a transition period as they go into public school, but then they get through that and then they understand where they came from and they tell their teachers at school and in the public school uh, the teachers recognize when they come from the Freedom School. We find that reading and writing English as a second language generally is initiated by students themselves. So perhaps when they're age eight or nine, they just, it opens a window in their minds that perhaps they can master the second language. And so they just take it upon themselves to start learning. I believe that part of it is the approach that we teach our students by the phonics system certain combinations of letters sound this way and so I always tell them when you read English it's the same way you'll get combinations of letters and that makes the sound of the word and so they're able to do that and as I said they may struggle uh, through a transition period into public school but they do get through it and they do a lot better and after public school when they're completed it's their decision and we've had some of our students as agriculturalists, laborers, carpenters, electricians, nurses, mothers at home and frontline workers 
and what I see probably the most, the thing that I really uh, look at is young people take, picking up their responsibilities at traditional ceremonies. You can approach them and they'll get the job done, whatever it may be, and they're not shy about standing up and doing uh, the opening or closing the Ohonda Galiwatakwa at those ceremonies. Next slide. And also, we do have an incorporated body of the school. It's called the Friends of the Aquasasana Freedom School. A lot of our administrative funds are run through the incorporated body. And just networking within Aquasasana has raised the profile of the school. And it was easier for us in this last a a grant to place our students at different positions in the community where fluent speakers existed. As I said, the, um, the actual attendance at outside events, outside of the school, we've always been invited as a group to attend because of our, their cultural knowledge and their ability to understand and speak Kanyankeha. Again, networking of the incorporated body has been really good over the last few years. It's increased nationally and regionally. Uh, it's opened doors for us to other areas of funding. And actually we find that over the last few years visitation by visitors to the school has increased and this past year alone we had 10 groups of visitors this last year and they traveled in from North America and overseas. Next slide. And so that's it. Thank you for listening. And that's my name and phone number for the school and my email address for questions if you think of any after. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Maxine. <laughs> okay, so we've had two very interesting presentations from our participants. And now is the question and answer period. The first question is from Mark St. Pierre, and it's, can we hear some of the expenses or budget details of how staff are commensurated? And we'll give that to Marcella first. Marcella, are you interested in answering? Sure. Um, for our teachers and our uh, elders, uh, we compensate them uh, $25 an hour. For our, our assistant teachers, uh, we compensate them uh, $18 an hour. And for our language advisors, um, we compensate them $50 an hour. Okay, and Maxine? Uh, we were fortunate in that uh, our sole resource financially was not a and &A, And so we actually paid for two staff, I believe, full time, and the other staff were half time, I believe, or one quarter time. Um, financially, I couldn't give you a dollar amount. I only know that that was the breakdown. And our resource people that came in, it depended who they are, uh, what age, and what expertise they offered, and if they were fluent speakers. Our fluent speakers, I know we paid more in about, um, I think Marcella, Marcella referred to about $50 an hour, and I'm, I'm thinking that's about what it was. I, I wasn't the person looking after the budget, so I'm kind of, that's the best I can answer. I hope we answered your question, Mark. The next question is, do you give the students a stipend to attend? And this, this is the question from Teresa Pelcher. Again, we'll start with Marcella. Uh, no, we don't give stipends to our students. It's just for our language team that we um, hire to go through the training and then teach the classes. And our uh, teachers and assistant teachers, they put in about 250 hours each grant year. And our advisors and elders, they put in about 160 hours each grant year. OK, thank you. Uh, Maxine? Uh, no, we didn't actually give the students stipends. But the thing is, we were able to, as we were saying, we we're very fortunate in that we worked with the Aquasasne Cultural Resource Program on one of our grants, which came from elsewhere. And it was a small grant. They produced four uh, booklets based on environment, environmental issues within Aquasasne. And from that grant, we were able to give them uh, just 
probably minimum wage, maybe a little bit yeah. under minimum wage because we consider there uh, as a student and um, I think mostly that was it. They were a student and so in their capabilities to read and write and research and also in creating the actual uh, product. And so as I said through other monies we were able to give them uh, less than minimum wage. And then one student uh, we actually paid because he was able to teach us, his whole the whole class and teachers how to make baskets. So we we did pay him as a resource person. Thank you. Our next question is this one's for Marcella. Marcella, the question's from LVR Sargent. I have a question for Marcella regarding the two week camp. What are the hours of the camp and how many participants is it open to and how much language do they learn? Our immersion camps um, are two days. Um, and they run from uh, 9 in the morning till 5 in the afternoon and we provide um, breakfast and lunch to all the participants and uh, the whole days, um, the whole two days are all in the language because we want to uh, immerse the students as much as possible and I think the only time uh, we break into English is during the meal time, so the hour of breakfast and the hour of lunch. Okay. Um, did you? I'm sorry. Did you mention how much language they learned during the camp? Um, they learn a lot from uh, the activities. So the first day, they'll start on the basics of uh, introducing themselves, and then uh, depending on the activity, whether it's beading or working on fish, um, they get a lot of vocabulary around the the activity that they're involved in. Okay. Thank you. Okay, the next question comes from Mark St. Pierre again. I think the most important is helping other programs understand methods to create fluency. How do we access these folks and their ideals? Could we receive this in a follow-up email? Our goal would be adult and family fluency. Have you had experience with folks who spoke as children but do not speak as adults? Um, Maxine, do you want to take on this one? Okay, one thing I would like to encourage you is to send me an email and we can I can follow up with you on the methods to create fluency and also I wanted to address the fact that yes, actually um, we do have experience in different situations with people about having spoken in their homes at a very young age and then gone to public school and as adults, you know, had they said they virtually forgot everything they learned at home. Uh, in my case, I was exposed to fluent speakers at home. They, I asked my mother one time, how come I never learned? And she said, well, I didn't know I had to teach you. <laughs> she said, I thought you would just pick it up. And in some cases, you know, uh, but at that time, this, uh, this is telling you what age I am, uh, TV came out. And it was a wonderful thing, right? So all the kids came to our house to watch TV. Uh, so we had a lot of influence at Eng of English at that time. And so what I find though is that when what we found as adults, when they started learning, they started to remember a lot of things, a lot of the language. And maybe they weren't ever exposed to written uh, material but they knew exactly what they were being asked to do and not that they could repeat it back to you, give an answer to your question, but they learned to do that over time. And one woman comes to mind where her mother just spoke to her all her life, but she could never speak it. And she had to overcome that fear of speaking. And so once she did though, her dialect and her ability to talk just increased by Every day you could see the increase in her language, her use of language. And then she married a fluent speaker too, so that really boosted her ability to speak too. So it, uh, we do see it and it does happen and it just seems to, they hit a wall and then once they're through that wall, they can, and it's, and it's just about encouraging them. We had a very good teacher and she encouraged all of us, no matter what, no matter who laughed at us, to keep going and to keep trying because she knew it would eventually come. 
That was an awesome answer, Betsy. <laughs> now we know how old you are. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. There's one more question from Donald Miller. I am interested in the language, but do you ever think that someone is too old to start? And we'll, we'll go with Marcella on this one, and then we'll go to Maxine afterwards. I think anytime you're ready to learn your language is a good time to start. Um, all of our classes are multidimensional, so we have babies and toddlers um, mingled in from being that young as well as elders, uh, all interacting and learning together. And they're really able to um, help one another, which is really encouraging because um, some of our elders um, are have gone through a lot of trauma um, with speaking their language in the past. And so um, with them seeing a lot of the encouragement from the young people and their eagerness to learn has encouraged them more to help uh, share more in the classes and being a resource with our language team and um, with our training and our immersion strategies gathering we have had historical language trauma workshops and it's been a lot of weight lifted off of our elders shoulders because um, one of our Anupiak elders said just hearing her language she can taste the soap in her mouth from being punished when she was younger and so I think um, anyone who's willing to learn at any age, uh, we try to encourage them as best we can. Yes, and I would just like to add to that, to what Marcella has said, that it's true, I believe anybody at any age can learn, and as with um, other peoples, other Ungwehunwe peoples, a lot of our people had gone through residential school and have some of that same reaction, and why parents didn't teach their children to speak their own language. And so once working through that, I see that um, anybody can learn at any time. I was always told you have to want it though. You got to want it. And so well, there was a certain age and my mother was getting on in years and I said, uh, my God, you know, I'd really love to speak to her in Ganyankeha as she gets older and not just use English with her. And so I really took a task to that to task myself with doing that and I asked my mother to help me and she said she would you know she said finally <laughs> and so um, I think it's really important that it's not about age it's about what you want to do and using the resource people that you know I have in my community because I see as elders pass away like that part of our language is going with them and I think that's a real shame. It's like grasp them, grasp today and hang on to it and learn as much as you can. We have one more question from Mark again. How much actual exposure in hours is needed to make solid growth in use and fluency? Well, I'm sure everyone is different. What do you think? Because it has a lot to do with budget and program design. Okay, um, Marcella, do you want to take the first crack at this one? Sure. Um, our our evening language classes um, are each two hours, uh, and they meet once a week. Um, when we had an overabundance of um, students, we um, split the larger classes that met two separate evenings for two hours a week. But um, having the two classes twice really helped. Um, in our teachers' fluency because they're speaking it more uh, in the class with the um, guidance of the elders that we have. Um, I think if we had um, more uh, flexibility with the use of our space, I think we can have the classes, each language group, um, twice a week if possible. But because of the scheduling of space, we're in, we can't, we aren't able to have it twice a week for each language. And I'm going to follow up with uh, uh, to what Marcella has said. The, in the adult immersion program, we worked six hours out of the day in Ganyakeha. We were shot for complete immersion environment. And so, of course, we had homework. So I would take that work with me and go to my mother's and sit with her for one hour. 
uh, for each night just to review what I had been given. And so whenever I had the chance, I always exposed myself to fluent speakers so that I could pick up their dialect the way they said things because Marcella referred to this in her presentation is that one of the challenges is dialect of the language and we're not any different from any other Umguahua is that within Akwazasana itself we know we're divided into three areas uh, and we know where people live because of the way they speak and use their language and so for myself I was very dedicated and it was something that I really wanted so I vowed to, I did probably eight hours a day to begin with and um, by the end of that hour, eight hours my brain was fried and but I found that the more I learned the more I wanted to learn and the more I exposed myself to the language so um, I hope that helps you. So with that answer I think we'll close our question and answer session. Upcoming webinars. Uh, in the month of February, we have two that are scheduled. The first one is on February 9th, is Effective Project Objectives and Outcomes, and that will be hosted by Western Region Training and Technical Assistance Center. And two weeks after that, on February 23rd, it'll be Eastern's turn again to host a, a webinar, and that will be on the A&E Funding Opportunities and Useful Application Development Tools. Well, I'd like to thank you for joining us today. I uh, would really like to thank the presenters, Maxine and Marcella. I had an awesome experience listening to your <laughs> situations and um, your experiences. So um, I, I thank you on behalf of all of us, uh, the attendees. Um, I truly enjoyed this webinar. I hope you all did too. Um, I'm going to sign off and um, everybody take care of yourself. Oh, no.